my name is Victor Fong. I am um, going to sing you a song. You raise me up. I'm just kidding. Uh, my goal is to introduce the uh, two speakers. Um, first is uh, Mr. McCaskill. He has interviewed. Um, everybody knows his name, Ever Snowden, the uh, whistleblower. So we'll talk about this interview and, uh, and other issues. And then, after his talk, we'll take a five minute break. You know, we can go to the bathroom or have a quick lunch or something. And then, uh, Steve Sack, a very famous. Uh, Cartoonist, it's, uh, political and social cartoons. Uh, I think we all enjoy. Okay, without uh, further delay, let's welcome uh, Mr. Makashki. University for the invitation to come back to Hong Kong. I really appreciate it. Um, as you know, I was here 18 months ago uh, to be Edward Stone, so it's a real sense of nostalgia to be back. And, uh, I was down in Nathan Road uh, yesterday, passing the Mira Hotel, where I spent so many hours with uh, Stone. Um, I've been asked to do two interviews, uh, sorry, two lectures. Uh, one on Edward Snowden, uh, the personality, and on Friday, uh, a lecture about Snowden documents and uh, the issue of uh, government surveillance versus uh, privacy. Uh, there's a bit of overlap, but today I will keep the focus mainly on Edward Snowden. Uh, but I will mention in passing uh, the, the wider issues. Um, and if you have questions about surveillance rather than uh, Edward Snowden, then I'm happy to take them. Um, the, the big debate, especially in America, is whether uh, Edward Snowden is a whistleblower or whether he's a traitor. And the opinion in America seems to be fairly evenly divided. It's about 50-50, 50% feel that he's a hero, that uh, he's done the world a favor by revealing the extent of surveillance. And the other 50%, some of them vehemently are opposed to him. They think he's a traitor. He's, he's given away uh, important secrets. And he's compromised American security. Um, I think he's a whistleblower, but you can make up your own mind. All Snowden wanted was to have a debate. He is a patriot. Uh, he believes in intelligence. He believes that the NSA uh, basically is doing a good job. Uh, but he thought that some of the things they're doing were unconstitutional. In May last year, Edward Snowden was based in Hawaii. Uh, he was a contractor for the National Security Agency. The National Security Agency is the biggest uh, spy surveillance organization in the world. Um, and it just gobbles up data and information um, on an industrial scale. And um, we hadn't realized quite how much until Snowden uh, re revealed these documents. In May last year, he flew from Hawaii to Hong Kong and uh, he checked in to 
as expensive to tell in uh, Kowloon. Uh, but it was too expensive for him, so after a few days he moved out into the Mira Hotel, uh, which is equally, ex it wasn't as expensive, but it's still an upmarket hotel, but it, it was sort of, it was slightly cheaper. Uh, and he was taking a huge gamble. Before he went to uh, Hong Kong, he'd been in touch with journalists, and he hoped that journalists would turn up in Hong Kong. He had no guarantee. He contacted uh, uh, two journalists. He contacted Bart Gelman at the Washington Post. And the Washington Post people were um, nervous about sending a reporter to Hong Kong. So they thought, one, the reporter's going to be dealing with someone who might be a spy. And he's going to be dealing with top secret documents. And he was going to, going to be dealing with documents, top secret documents in China. And the people in Washington Post were still thinking, great China, communist China, American spy, this is really dangerous uh, legal position. So in the end, uh, the Washington Post didn't send the reporter. Mark Gelman was on his way to the airport to fly to Hong Kong. Uh, and then at the last minute decided uh, it probably wasn't a good idea. The, uh, the Guardian journalists, uh, Glenn Greenwald, myself, and uh, Laura Petrias, uh, a filmmaker, decided that we would fly to Hong Kong. Um, when we flew to Hong Kong, we didn't know if uh, Snowden was really a spy or if this was a hoax or some sort of crackpot. And he took a, so he took a gamble in coming to Hong Kong, a big risk to come to Hong Kong with tens of thousands of uh, top secret documents uh, in the hope that journalists would turn up. His other gamble was coming to Hong Kong. He looked around the world at some place where he would be relatively safe uh, when America came after him. And he decided that Hong Kong offered the safest haven because of its uh, judicial system, uh, because of its tradition of free speech. And he thought that he expected that after he handed over the documents to journalists, he would, um, the America would start extradition proceedings and that he could fight the extradition proceedings for maybe a few months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, but eventually he would end up back in America in jail. So he was prepared to do that uh, in the hope that at least in Hong Kong he would have at least maybe a year of freedom. As a result of this story, there's lots of consequences. Uh, what is this, the, according to the National Security Agency, this is the biggest leak in Western intelligence uh, history. Uh, I'm not entirely sure of that. In Britain, uh, we had spies like Kim Philby, um, who released, who was a traitor for 20 or 30 years, handing over secrets to the Russians. I'm not sure that uh, Snowden has done as much damage as uh, Kim Philby. But the, uh, this is what the Americans say. Um, he started a worldwide debate on surveillance versus privacy. Um, companies like Google and Facebook have lost billions of dollars because people are uh, skeptical, uh, are angry with them for handing over personal data. And uh, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, are all having to change as a result of the Snowden revelations. Uh, the freedom of uh, speech, freedom of press issues here, uh, lots of pressure on the Guardian as a consequence of uh, publishing these stories. And there's consequences, especially for Edward Snowden. He, he took, uh, as I said, he took a huge gamble coming to Hong Kong and uh, He's paid, he had a good life in Hawaii, and he's paid a big price for it. He's now in exile in Moscow, and uh, he'll probably be in 
uh, Moscow for years to come. Uh, so huge consequences for him. I, I'm so sad at the beginning. Um, some of you were at the opening ceremony yesterday. I'm a reporter in The Guardian. I've been a reporter for uh, 20 years. I've covered wars, I've covered politics. I covered the last two US elections. I was in the uh, Guardian's office in New York in May last year. And it, it was a Friday lunchtime. And for me, Friday lunchtime, I was thinking about the weekend, you know, what was going to do. Um, I was writing a piece about a film star who was in jail in America. And the Guardian's US editor, Janine Gibson, signaled to me across the newsroom and said, I want you to go to Hong Kong tomorrow. And I said, sure. Uh, I mean, that's lesson number one if you're a journalist. If you're offered an assignment, you take it. Uh, if you don't take it, you might not be uh, asked for a, a second time. And, and the idea of coming to Hong Kong, I've been to Hong Kong many times before. I was happy to come uh, back. Uh, so I immediately said, sure, yeah, I'll go to Hong Kong tomorrow. I didn't know what she wanted. Then she said, there's a guy in Hong Kong claiming to be a spy and he's got tens of thousands of uh, documents he wants to give us. And uh, she thought this was preposterous. She didn't think it was true. And I didn't think it was true. Uh, so I thought, we'll go and check it out. And I came to Hong Kong with one set of clothes, because I thought I was just going to be here for two days. And then I was here for two weeks. I, I came with uh, Laura Poitras, She's an American filmmaker who lives in Berlin. And Glenn Greenwald, who's an American blogger who lives in uh, Brazil. Stoughton had read Glenn Greenwald's blog, which deals with national security, and liked Glenn's writing. And uh, he contacted Glenn and said, look, he contacted him. Uh, by email and said, look, I want, there's something important I want to talk to you. But you need encrypted mail. You need the encrypted chat. Uh, Glenn is like me. He's totally naive about um, computer security. And Glenn couldn't be bothered putting the software into his computer to get the messages from Snowden. So Glenn ignored uh, Snowden's uh, invitation. And Glenn was in danger of missing one of the biggest stories of his life, maybe the biggest story he'll ever cover, because he didn't have the proper software. So that's lesson number two. Uh, and I'll keep saying this, you need to get encrypted emails. You need to get safe uh, software. <laughs> um, then he did the same thing with Laura Petraeus in uh, Berlin. Laura had done uh, short films about whistleblowers. Uh, there was a previous NSA whistleblower called William Binney. And Laura had done a 12 minute film about Binney for the New York Times. And uh, Stoughton was a press list. So he sent Laura an email saying, do you have encrypted chat? And Laura says, yes. And Stoughton says, well, you need better encrypted chat. Will you install the software? Software. I'm going to send you software, and I want you to install it. Uh, Laura had more patience and more technical understanding than Glenn, and she did that. Uh, so she started exchanging um, messages with Snowden. So Glenn and Laura both came to New York, discussed it with the Guardian, and the three of us went to Hong Kong. But at that point. None of the three of us knew who Stone was. We didn't recognize him. He hadn't told us his name. He just told us he had documents. Uh, we'd meet us in Hong Kong. And uh, so we took a chance. We thought it was worth going to see whether it was true or not. Uh, yesterday, at the opening ceremony, I, I apologized and said that a strong Scottish accent and wondered if people would comprehend it. And uh, 
afterwards an uh, English uh, lecturer said I should stop apologising that I was comprehensible. <laughs> uh, so, when, when we uh, when we arrived in Hong Kong, Stone was only expecting two journalists. He's expecting Laura and Edward Stone. And so they said, look, you shouldn't come along to the first meeting because he sees three people, especially one that looks like you. Uh, <laughs> you might sort of spook him. <laughs> uh, so I agreed to that. So Glenn and Laura went to see him at the Vera Hotel. And they said that they would meet. Uh, Stone's instructions were he'd be standing next to a crocodile in the Mira Hotel and that he'd be holding a Ru Rubik's Cube. Uh, so Glenn and Laura went to the Mira, didn't see anyone at the appointed time, but they had a second time arranged uh, two hours later. So they came back two hours later and Stone was there with his Rubik's Cube and they went to his room. And their initial response was, in Stoughton, was 29 at the time. But if you see pictures of him, he only looks about your age. He looks about 20, 21. He's thin and... So they, they were expecting somebody like me, somebody that was so old and disgruntled and disillusioned. <laughs> uh, he'd been around a long time and had been passed over for in career terms. They didn't expect somebody that was looked as if he was sort of 20, 21. Next, next day, I went with Glenn and Laura to see Stone, and then we interviewed him constantly for something like eight days. When we saw him in the uh, Mira Hotel, he was totally paranoid. Nowadays, as a journalist, I don't carry a camera because I use my iPhone to, to take pictures. I don't carry a tape recorder because I used my iPhone to record interviews. <laughs> uh, so what, the first thing I did when I saw Snowden was, I took out my iPhone and said, um, do you mind if I, if I record this um, interview? And he, he looked as if I'd sort of introduced a dragon or, uh, you know, he was absolutely appalled that I had, I had an iPhone with me. He said, look, that's a listening device, the NSA, can listen to every word that we are saying. I said, okay, I'll switch it off. He says, they can still listen to it. I said, I'll take the battery out of it. He said, they'll still take, they can still listen. He said, the only safe place to put it is to put it in the fridge. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll put it in the fridge. He said, but you might put it in the freezer compartment of the fridge. <laughs> and not even in his room, I had to put it in Laura Petrius's room. Uh, so he, I, and then once we were in the room, he piled pillows up the side of the door in case there was someone outside eavesdropping. Uh, I don't think it would be very effective, but that's why he wanted to do that anyway. When, when, when he was on his computer, uh, when, he, when he put passwords into his computer to access it, he put a red hood over his head. And the red hood covered his laptop and computer as well. Because he was scared that if there's someone spying through the windows, or if there's a hidden camera in his hotel room, they would be able to see his passwords. Yeah, at the time, both myself and Glenn thought this guy's completely nuts. Uh, now, I think these are just sort of elementary precautions. Uh, I share uh, Edward Stone's paranoia. Um, I don't use an iPhone anymore. I have complicated passwords. I don't use a red hood. Uh, uh, everything. Constantly, throughout the interviews, every day that we went to see Stone, we thought, he won't be there tomorrow. He won't be there today. We assumed that he'd have been lifted by the CIA. Uh, Stone himself said to us repeatedly, he thought, you'll either be lifted by the CIA, the Hong Kong police, or the CIA would get a triad gang to uh, snatch him. So he, 
he felt very vulnerable in the Mira Hotel. Uh, when we were interviewing him, we constantly expected um, the door to come flying in and either the CIA, Hong Kong police, or a triad gang to snatch the porpoise. Uh, but it never happened. And it's a puzzle to me why it never happened. Because it would have been so easy to find uh, Stone, and it would have been so easy to find uh, us. But for some reason, we were lucky. Uh, maybe in 50 years' time, when we have access to CIA or intelligence documents, we might get an explanation. Stone, someone asked me yesterday about Assange. Stone is not like Julian Assange, the uh, WikiLeaks uh, founder. He's very shy. Uh, he's very geeky. Uh, he's, uh, he's very modest. He doesn't. He said repeatedly he didn't want to be the story. He didn't want the, the media stories to be about him. He wanted them to be about the documents he was giving us. Um, he didn't do it for the money. If he wanted money, he would have sold these documents to the Chinese government or... <laughs> um, he didn't do it because he wanted to be famous. Um, he might one day write a book that he hasn't so far. Um, he did it because he, he was inside the... Uh, the American intelligence establishment, and he saw things he didn't like. Uh, he thought the intelligence services had gone too far. Be before we could write the story, we had to establish that he really was a spy, and that this wasn't some elaborate hoax. Uh, this happened before with the Hitler diaries, where the Sunday Times published uh, what was supposed to be Adolf Hitler's. Uh, diaries that turned out to be a huge hoax, even though they looked fairly realistic. And the Guardian was scared that this guy might turn out to be the same. And you've got to remember, this guy, as I said, he's 29, he looks 21, and then he starts to describe his life story. He left school at 16. He didn't go to university. And I think it was because he was so smart on computers. He was just bored by higher education. But for whatever reason, when he started to describe his life story, it seemed more and more incredible that this guy could be real. First of all, he's a patriot. He wanted to go and fight uh, after 9-11. So he joined the army and did training for the special forces. That's really intensive training. Uh, he broke, he said he broke both legs, and I thought, well, that's a bit strange. Uh, then he said uh, he was recruited by uh, the NSA, then he was recruited by the CIA, and he went to work for the CIA in Geneva. Uh, he then uh, went to work for the NSA back in America, then he got a job working for the NSA in Japan. Uh, then he got a job with the NSA as a contractor back in America. And then he got a job with the NSA in Hawaii. Now I'm looking at him and thinking, how can this guy possibly have done all these things? And but the more he started to just describe what life was like inside the NSA, and he started to produce documents. And, and the documents looked real. And here's another lesson for journalists. I mean, I still wasn't happy with this story. I said, look, how do I know that you are who you claim to be? And he produced a suitcase full of documentation. He gave us his driving license, his social security number, his CIA uh, ID, just a whole host of documents, bank statements, and, uh, and at the end of it, and maybe at the end, you just go on instinct. And my instinct was to trust him, that, you know, I believed that he was who he said he was. And his, as I said, he's a patriot, but his attitude started to change when he was in Geneva with the CIA. He was there as a computer specialist, but he went out in a field operation. 
And there's a banker that the Americans wanted to target because the, this banker had access to uh, the accounts of uh, people in Saudi Arabia and uh, other uh, people in the Middle East. And this banker, the CIA people, according to Snowden, uh, got this banker drunk, then it allowed them or encouraged them to drive home, even though he was drunk. And then they phoned the police to say that this banker was drunk and driving home. They stopped by the police. The CIA uh, fixed it so they get off. And um, the uh, and because the CIA had sort of squared it with the police, then this guy felt a sense of gratitude. Uh, now, and given that everything else Snowden has told us is true, uh, I've no reason to disbelieve this, even though it seems slightly incredible. And maybe that's the way spies operate. Maybe that's the way they recruit people. So the disillusionment set in then. But the, the, so he was thinking, even in those days, when he looked at NSA documents and saw the extent of the surveillance, and he thought, this goes against the American Constitution. And he was going to uh, leak the documents before 2008, but then he saw Barack Obama, and he thought, I mean, Snowden is not, did not, didn't vote for Obama, but he thought he would be a good president. Snowden voted for uh, Ron Paul, who's a, sort of a Republican, right-winger, libertarian. Um, who, they believe in small government, and uh, they believe in the Constitution, and that sort of aligned with uh, Snowden's politics. But he thought that Barack Obama would bring change. Uh, after the election, although Obama had promised to be more transparent, um, actually nothing uh, changed. So at that point, uh, Snowden started to think again about um, uh, leaking the documents. He initially gave us, a, he called it a, we, a welcome pack, which was a group of about 20 documents. Uh, and then subsequently he gave us tens of thousands, probably maybe something like 200,000 documents. The NSA said it's 1.7 million documents he gave us, but I don't think it's as huge as that. It's more like, uh, it's in the hundreds of thousands, but even that is a, an enormous quantity of uh, top secret documents to have. Um, the first story we did was um, dealt with a, a US telecom company called Verizon. And it showed that um, the NSA uh, were, had access to the phone records of tens of billions of Americans. Uh, the second document, uh, second sort of story we produced, and so did the Washington Post, uh, was the PRISM document. And that showed that uh, companies like Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Google, Skype, uh, were all handing over uh, personal data uh, to the NSA. Um, then we did document about White House uh, cyber security policy. Uh, showing that contrary to the White House claims, um, the, they were engaged in aggressive cyber security, not purely defensive. So, so the, uh, over the last six months, over the last year, we've done uh, lots of stories about these sort of technical uh, surveillance documents. And the story that caused the biggest, uh, the biggest impact was four, we did four scoops in a row and then on the fifth day, uh, Edward Snowden went public. Uh, Laura did a 12-minute video, which was put up on the Guardian website, and then it was picked up by CNN, BBC. Uh, it went everywhere. And, and it was unusual. I mean, most whistleblowers want to remain anonymous. But Snowden. Uh, decided from the outset, he said he wanted to 
go public. And he said the reason for this was he'd been inside the NSA when ever there was a leak uh, inquiry before, then he'd seen his colleagues uh, subjected to intense scrutiny. And rather than seeing his colleagues go through that ordeal, uh, he wanted, uh, he thought it would be better to go public. It also had more impact because he went public. Myself and Glenn and Laura said, well, you don't have to go public. We're quite happy for you to remain an anonymous source. Um, I felt sorry for him. I have three sons, uh, roughly uh, Snowden's age. And I was looking at Snowden and thinking, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. Uh, this is much more serious than WikiLeaks. The doc Snowden is facing three charges just now uh, under the Espionage Act uh, for spying. These are just the three initial charges. Uh, if he goes back to America, he's going to face uh, a hell of a lot more than just the uh, three charges. He's looked at life in prison. Um, so we were well aware of that, but Snowden was adamant that he was going to go uh, public. When that story went public, in the early hours of the morning in Hong Kong, it was about three or four o'clock. Next morning, there was total mayhem. Uh, Myself and Glenn were staying at the W Hotel in the West Kowloon, and the lobby was just full of uh, journalists and camera crews. Because they thought, because Glenn and myself were staying at the W Hotel, that um, uh, Stone must also be at the W Hotel. Uh, and he wasn't, as you know, he was in the mirror. So it was total pandemonium. It, it got so bad that the management of the W Hotel told myself and Glenn we'd have to leave. Um, the, uh, the hotel was full and uh, there wasn't room for us that night. So you had all these journalists looking for Snowden and they did something really smart. Uh, they only had one, they only had a couple of pictures of Snowden. Um, but they crowdsourced the picture and asked if anybody could identify the hotel. And I always thought they identified it because uh, because of the lamp, maybe the lamp was distinctive, and um, the, uh, the I've been told subsequently that it wasn't the lamp; it was either the uh, the desk or the curtains or something else that somebody smart uh, was able to recognise. The first journalist to work out that uh, Snowden was at the mirror was the Wall Street Journal. And uh, the Wall Street Journal phoned uh, Snowden's hotel room and said, can I speak to Mr. Edward Snowden, please? And Snowden picked up, who was on the phone, and said, uh, no, there's no Edward Snowden here. <laughs> and at that point, he realized he was going to have to uh, leave. And the, the Guardian had a lawyer. I, I requested the Guardian lawyer uh, come and give some advice about the legal position. And the Guardian lawyer arranged for two lawyers in Hong Kong, uh, Jonathan Mann and Robert Thibault, uh, to give advice to uh, Snowden. And uh, I think he, he originally went, he left the mirror. He tried to disguise himself. It was totally pathetic. He, he changed his hairstyle and he shaved off his beard. He, his razor wasn't strong enough so he left some stubble <laughs> and he got a green umbrella and thought if he put his head under the umbrella people might not be able to recognise him. You know, for a spy it was totally protected. <laughs> uh, he, he made it out and then he disappeared and no one, and he was staying, he was living with somebody in Hong Kong and to this day uh, we don't know who this benefactor uh, was. And at that point, uh, is Lana from the South China Morning Post here? Ah. And Snowden thought, if I'm going to survive in Hong Kong, I'm going to need um, to get the public opinion in Hong Kong on site. And so uh, someone contacted uh, Lana and he did an interview with Lana over encrypted chat from 
the hotel that we moved to, the Sheraton Hotel, and uh, Lana got her uh, exclusive interview with uh, Snowden, uh, revealing the extent to which uh, uh, the US was spying in China, but also in Hong Kong, and uh, she received uh, awards for that in June this year. Uh, do you want to say what it was like? <laughs> international impact and um, the the reaction that it got, you know, moments after we put the story up online. I've never experienced that sort of uh, 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 result as uh, after a story of mine had been published. So, so it was a uh, during the, then the two weeks that he was here, it was um, incredibly exciting, but incredibly stressful and and the intense pressure um, that we were under, I guess, to stay on top of the story and, and, and all of that. So it was, um, it was a time I'll never forget, <laughs> certainly. So you wanted to meet yeah. this first conversation. Yeah, so it was all done through the encrypted chat, like you were saying. Um, in, but sort of in the lead up to that, there'd been sort of various things in terms of meeting certain people in a certain place in the hotel and being very cautious of who might be following me or, or whatnot. And then over the next two weeks, um, uh, when he was still in Hong Kong, when I would meet with, say, the lawyers um, that were close to Snowden and having to take certain precautions, like changing my phone or not having my phone with me, taking the battery out of the phone if I ever did have it. Um, so things like that. It was like, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, at this point, uh, Snowden was in hiding and we didn't know where he was. Um, and after two weeks, uh, his intention was to stay in Hong Kong and fight extradition. Uh, but he was told, um, and this, he hadn't really done his homework, Snowden wanted to get the documents out to the media. He had never really thought hard about an exit plan. Uh, so he's usually meticulous in his research, but he hadn't done it for his exit plan. And I've spoken to him about, about it since, and he says, um, he just, just the idea of getting the documents to the journalists was enough for him, getting the debate started. But what happened to him afterwards? He thought about it, but not in the detail that he should have. So basically, when he came to Hong Kong, he hadn't really done his homework. He hadn't done his research. And what he was alarmed at was that he thought he'd be free in Hong Kong while the extradition hearings were going on. What he hadn't counted on was that the Hong Kong police were going to arrest him and he'd be jailed uh, during the extradition proceedings. But what really appalled him was that he'd be in jail without his laptop. But for someone like Snowden, who lives in his laptop and lives in his computer and lives in this twilight world of sitting up to 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning on his computer, the idea of not having access to the internet was the worst thing that could possibly happen to him. Uh, so at that point, uh, WikiLeaks came in, Julian Assange, who's stuck in the embassy, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and um, said, look, we can help you escape and he suggested that he fly. Uh, he sent a WikiLeaks press officer, uh, Sarah Harrison, to Hong Kong and arranged for Snowden to fly to Moscow, from Moscow to Cuba, Cuba to, I think, Ecuador. Um, and, and that seems a sort of reasonable plan. <laughs> um, except on, on his way to Moscow, the Americans canceled his passport. He had no longer a sort of legal entity. And in Moscow, the Russians wanted him anyway. Uh, 
they refused to allow him to fly on to Cuba and Ecuador. So he's stuck in Russia now. Uh, initially, I was critical of WikiLeaks and said that was really stupid. Uh, you, he's ended up in Russia and it's your fault. But I don't think that anymore. Because basically there's nowhere in the world other than Russia where Edward Snowden would be safe. If he'd gone to Ecuador or Venezuela or Iceland, uh, the places he's spoken about, the CIA could easily have put in a, sna a snatch squad into Ecuador and taken them uh, back to the US. Uh, they could put economic and diplomatic pressure on Iceland or Ecuador or Venezuela, despite Venezuela's independence and criticism of uh, America down the years. These countries are vulnerable. Um, one suggestion was that he could have gone from Hong Kong to mainland China, but China didn't want them either. And we were told that the Chinese government at the border would have stopped Snowden crossing the border into China. Because they, they don't want to have a confrontation, uh, have bad relations with America over some American spies. Uh, so when you look at it, you look around the world, uh, Russia's not a great option. Snowden doesn't want to be there. He'd much rather be in Western Europe. He'd much rather be back in America. Uh, but that was about the only option that was uh, available to him. Uh, he's got a life of sorts in uh, Russia now. Uh, he's got access to his computer. He can sit on the internet and sort of campaign from then on. Now, I'm just going to wind up now and then I'll take uh, any questions. Um, I haven't spoken about the wider issues of surveillance and national security. I'll leave that to Friday. But on, on, on journalism, now a lot of people think because I'm old and I've worked in newspapers all my life that I'm sort of wedded to papers. I'm not. I've embraced the digital revolution. When I was in America, I, didn't, I never saw copies of The Guardian. Everything I did was online. Um, I think doing stories digitally is much better uh, than doing it in print. Um, I doubt if there's probably ever been a better time to be a journalist than now. Anybody can be a journalist. You can blog. Um, you're, if I write a story now, within 30 seconds, someone will say, uh, your Kansas City isn't in this state, or you're totally biased, you're useless. It's good to have that feedback. It's more democratic. Um, with, with stories, you can tell the story better now online than you can in the, a newspaper. You can embed video. You can do graphics and interactive, and you've got feedback. And so it's a much better and healthier uh, form of journalism ever before. And an example of this was after about four or five months of um, Snowden, uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to pull it all together and give it context. So we did a thing called NSA Decoded. You can look it up, and uh, it was one of the, it was an American interactive editor. His name was Gabe Gans. He's got fantastic imagination. Uh, he'd seen the New York Times did a thing called uh, Snowfall, which was a beautiful piece of interactive. Um, journalism. They dealt with a skiing accident in Colorado. And Gabe thought, well, we could do better than that. Stone is more important than a skiing accident in Colorado. So let's tell the story in a different way. So we, we, we wrote words, but we had interviews embedded in the copy. So as you scroll down, the people would start speaking, a former uh, NSA lawyer, uh, Glenn Greenwell, uh, members of Congress, uh, computer specialists. So as you scroll down, they start speaking to you. Uh, they also had fantastic interactive uh, graphics. It was absolutely a superb piece of work uh, by Gabe and his team. The important thing here is, I mean, a lot of people look at stories. If I write 4,000 words with no graphics, no interviews, hardly anybody's going to read it. In this day and age, people won't read that. Um, this one, especially people under the age of uh, 30, as teenagers uh, were reading it, and not just for one or two minutes, but for 15 to 18 minutes at a time. And that's almost unheard of. Uh, so, 
this was cutting edge journalism, this was the sort of future of uh, journalism. But, but a year on, it's old hat, and a year from now, or two years, it'll look redundant and ridiculous. Uh, but I mean, that's, where, that's where journalism's headed. And uh, just a final note on, uh, I mean, Lana received the awards in uh, June uh, for her work. Um, I received an Emmy for the that NSA decoded. I got loads of prize and other awards. And Glenn's received them and Laura's received them. And uh, that's great. The Snowden hasn't received anything. Uh, we're lucky. We we got all the plaudits. The Snowden's sitting in uh, Moscow. Uh, that's not the life that he envisaged for himself. Um, I mean, he, he's very well aware that he's living in a surveillance state and the irony of that. Uh, you know, it needs a campaign where he was in discussion with the US, uh, his lawyers were in discussion with the uh, US Justice Department up a few months ago about some sort of deal that would allow him to go back to the States, maybe do some prison time or... Um, under the Espionage Act, you can be tried with only one judge, there's no jury, and Snowden thought he doesn't stand a chance if it's only a judge. So he, as part of this deal, he wanted there to be a jury trial. And it looked as if there might be some agreement there, some wiggle room, but it hasn't happened. And there's been no discussion for the last uh, few months. So it looks as if Snowden, he's paid a heavy price. But I saw him in Moscow two months, two, three months ago. And uh, I said to him, do you regret what you've done? Are you sorry that you've ended up in Moscow? Uh, it was it too big a price to pay? And uh, unsurprisingly, he said no. He wanted a debate. Um, he wanted the world to have a debate about the extent of surveillance, whether it's gone too far, whether privacy's been eroded. Uh, he's got that debate, so he's satisfied. And if you any We have a few minutes for uh, questions. I have two questions. Uh, first, your accent is so thick. Could you repeat your entire presentation? <laughs> My other question is, I wasn't clear. Why do you think Snowden did not want to release the information anonymously? Within organizations like the NSA or the CIA or Britain's MI6 or MI5, uh, there are leak inquiries all the time. There have been about stories that we never hear about. Uh, there, there's a, the instinct there is to be suspicious. And uh, the, Snowden had, inside the NSA, had been present for the teams that he, he was a member of. And had had surveillance and uh, had been subjected to leak inquiries. And he saw the pressure that put on families and individuals. And he'd seen the pressure it put on his colleagues. And he just felt that he didn't want to subject them uh, to uh, that kind of ordeal. But it was also wider than that. He felt that. Uh, uh, that it'd be more forceful if he if he was to come out in public and say, look, I'm the whistleblower, I'm not hiding. Um, uh, I'm not ashamed of what I've done. I'm a whistleblower. I don't regard myself as a felon. I don't regard myself as a criminal. Um, and then there's a third reason. And that was basically, practically, it was impossible for him to re remain anonymous. And uh, once he'd gone to Hong Kong and we started reporting, uh, he, he, even before the first story was published, he, he realized they were going to find him. Before we published a single story, um, we went to see him in the Mirror Hotel and they received a message that day that the NSA police and uh, other intelligence police had been to his home in Hawaii 
and interviewed his girlfriend, uh, Lindsay Mills, and said, um, Edward Snowden uh, was supposed to get getting treatment. Uh, if he hasn't come back to the office, do you know where he is? So at that point, before a single story had been published, we were looking for him. So it was just a, a matter of time uh, before they would find him. And here is an absolutely ridiculous thing. When we published these stories in The Guardian, we had no, we had no daylight uh, because we didn't want them to know we were in Hong Kong. We didn't want to help them. So what does Glenn do when the first story appears? He goes to CNN, and Glenn is sitting there, and in the backdrop is Victoria Harbour. <laughs> you know, it'd be the, well, why the CIA didn't come and get us? Is, uh, to this day, I don't understand why they didn't come. Ian, I thought it would be interesting if you talked a bit about the backlash against the newspaper and how you had to destroy the documents in the basement yeah. from the newspaper. Point of view. The uh, I said this yesterday, you know, the, the, the American journalists enjoy constitutional rights that we don't have in Britain. And I think even then, American journalists are under pressure. But in Britain, the intelligence agencies and the government reacted really badly uh, to our publication of the Snowden documents. And within, after we published the first one, uh, the British government got in touch with the editor, Alan Ros Rosbridger. Uh, he's a very brave editor, he's been an editor for 20 years, and the Guardian has taken on uh, lots of members of the establishment, they've taken on politicians and police and uh, big corporations and uh, the Rupert Murdoch's empire, and uh, we did WikiLeaks and now we've done Snowden. So Alan is used to that kind of pressure and the, uh, the British government says, if, A, you've got to stop publishing these documents, or we'll take legal action against you. And uh, if you don't stop, we'll close you down. Uh, they said that we closed down the reporting, but they also meant that we closed down the paper. Uh, and that's debatable whether they could do that, but it certainly, and Alan's fear was that if it came, if they put an injunction against the Guardian, uh, the story would get caught up in the courts for two to three years, and we wouldn't be able to do any reporting. Uh, so Alan was desperate to try and avoid the courts. And then the pressure just became more and more intense. Uh, pressure on the reporters from the uh, back in Britain. And uh, eventually, uh, Clyde Greenwell's partner, uh, David Miranda in Rio, uh, was coming back from Berlin. He'd been to see Laura uh, Poitras in Berlin. He was flying back to Rio. Uh, via Heathrow Airport in London, and uh, he was arrested. Uh, he wasn't arrested, he was held in detention at Heathrow for nine hours. Now, I, I can't get too upset at the, the police and the intelligence services for doing that. They thought that he had documents, uh, which he did. Um, but they held him under the Terrorism Act. I mean, David Miranda is not a terrorist by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Um, if they wanted to hold them under the Official Secrets Act or something else, we'd have understood it. But to hold them under the Terrorism Act uh, was just absurd. And it was an act of intimidation. Uh, but the worst thing, and this is Britain in 2013, uh, for two, three hundred years we fought for the right of a free press. People like John Wilkes, Corbett, and um, you know, battles throughout the 19th century to try and establish freedom of the press and we had to fight again in the sort of 20th century to retain that. You know, Britain, uh, next year we celebrate the, uh, the Magna Carta. And what happens in Britain in 2013? The government said, you have to destroy all these stone documents. You're not allowed to have these documents in Britain, um, or we're going to 
uh, take an injunction out against you. So some people argued Alan should have stood outside the Guardian building with his arms outstretched and said, you will not pass, uh, close us down. But that would just have been stupid. We wanted to carry on reporting it. So Alan agreed to destroy all the documents uh, in the Guardian building. And he said, look, this is stupid because these documents exist in New York. They exist in Rio. They exist in Berlin. Uh, it, there's no practical purpose in uh, destroying them here. Uh, and the intelligence services, I don't know why they're called the intelligence services sometimes, because it wasn't an intelligence act, a very intelligent act. Um, so Alan said, we'll destroy the documents and the intelligence services as well. We've got to destroy the computers as well. Um, so, and then Alan said we would do that. And then he said, well, we have to want two members of the intelligence services to come into the Guardian and oversee the destruction of these computers. So one Saturday morning, the uh, Guardian's deputy editor and some other staff went down to the basement of the Guardian with hammers, hacksaws, uh, power drills, angle grinders, and reduced these computers. Because the intelligence people said, even if there's a small piece like that of the computer left, um, you know, they said that it was possible that people could gain access. And so they had to destroy it. Every time they'd turn around to the intelligence people and say, is that heap of rubble enough? And they'd say, no, you've got to make it smaller. And now some Guardian people wear parts of these computers around their neck as a memento. It was just ridiculous. That, Britain, the land of free speech, land of uh, free press, and yet the intelligence agencies and the government uh, go into uh, the Guardian newspaper uh, and enforce the destruction of computers. Okay, uh, that's uh, the last question. It's a take a break. Okay, that may be over there. I have two questions. The first one, as far as I remember, in Duke Harding's book, at some point when you ask Edward Snowden why he chose Hong Kong, he said, I, I think it was cold. Hong Kong is different from China. Hong Kong people protest on the streets. And now we are, we are of course, having what Snowden has sort of predicted in, um, I mean, in a way that many people told me is beyond the imagination. So I was always struck by why you can see something in Hong Kong that actually many people cannot see, first question. Second, I mean, cannot see, I think, I myself, you see the essence of Hong Kong, the, the way the life is so different. The second one is, uh, what is your feeling after writing this very big story of your life in Hong Kong when you're back? Thank you. I met you in New York. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the uh, three weeks ago, uh, Laura Petrias has done a documentary called Citizen Four. Uh, it's a two-hour documentary uh, dealing with the events I've described. About an hour of it is set in um, uh, the Mira Hotel, and. Uh, uh, and we were both at the premiere in New York three weeks ago. Um, that, that, that's an example of the absurdity of uh, the British government's position. But Laura and Len felt safe going to New York uh, for the premiere. Uh, the premiere was held in London two weeks ago, and Laura and Len wouldn't go because their lawyers told them they couldn't guarantee their safety in, the, in Britain, uh, which is a pretty abysmal state of affairs. Um, the difference between uh, Hong Kong and Beijing, when, when, when Snowden was debating whether to stay in Hong Kong and fight extradition or uh, you know, seek uh, sanctuary in Ecuador, he was told, you can fight extradition and maybe we can guarantee that the lawyers thought we could keep the battle going for a few months or a year. But the conclusion was that at the end, the decision of whether Snowden would be given a sanctuary, a refuge in Hong Kong, or whether uh, he would be sent back to America, 
would not be made by a judge, but it would be a political decision. And that political decision would be made by Beijing. Uh, so Snowden didn't believe in the independence of the Hong Kong judiciary. I think before he came here, he did. He thought that the legal uh, process in Hong Kong was fairly robust. But after being here, he thought that um, he was disabused of that. And he didn't believe that, uh, in the independence of the Hong Kong judiciary. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the answer you wanted to hear or not. Uh, and what the story um, has meant for me, well, when I came to Hong Kong, I said to you, I, I thought it was just coming for two days. Uh, for me, it was just another assignment. I had lots of assignments around the world, and um, to me, it was just another story. And even when we started to report it, it just felt like another story. The, day, the night that we sent the Verizon story to the Guardian, uh, I was discussing with uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, the impact, and I said to him, I think this story is too technical. I'm not even sure if the Guardian will splash it. I, I doubt, I'm not sure that it's going to even be the lead story. And uh, Glenn thought, yeah, maybe you're right. Uh, and Laura wasn't sure either. Snowden thought it was a big story. But all sources think that their story is a big story. Yeah. Uh, so when the, the Verizon story went up, uh, and then suddenly, bang, you know, it, it's a huge story in America. People seem to get it. And uh, then we did the Prism story. And because it involved Facebook and Google, I, I felt more comfortable and I thought, yeah, people will get this. Even then, even after a week of reporting this stuff, I thought, um, this story, after a month, this story's going to die away. You know, I didn't think it was going to go on and on. Uh, and Laura Petraeus said to me, uh, you know, journalism students are going to be talking about this story for years to come. But I thought, you're, cra you're crackers. <laughs> I, but I didn't for a minute believe that the story was that big. And now, uh, we are so staggered by the enormity of it. Uh, in London, there's three plays about Snowden. Uh, there's three documentaries. There's two books. And there's two movies coming out. Oliver Stone's doing one, and the James Bond people, the properly. Uh, uh, the Stone movie's out next year, and I think maybe the James Bond one uh, in the following year. Uh, I was, I was talking to uh, journalism students at Cardiff uh, last week, and uh, I was, afterwards I was, when I was chatting to them, they said to me, you still don't realise the enormity of this story, and, and maybe they're right. Okay, that's the one. I can't ask you, uh, thanks again. <laughs> Come back in five minutes, and we'll Listen to uh, another speaker. Okay. Okay. Uh, take a seat. And we're gonna resume our uh, public lecture today. Okay, the second speaker today is uh, uh, Mr. Steve Sack, he's a noted political cartoonist, and uh, his topic is right here, my life as a cartoonist. So let's welcome uh, Mr. Sack. Thank you very much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be in Hong Kong. Um, I'm so impressed with the city and the university. Can anyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I was so impressed with our last speaker. Um, he leads lead such a glamorous life, traveling around the world and meeting spies and 
I, I just sit in my office and draw little pictures, and most people don't even see me. I very rarely talk to public groups, so I'm a little nervous here. Uh, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to come to this forum. Uh, I'm a cartoonist. I, uh, my name is Steve Sack. I work for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I've been with the Star Tribune well, uh, for, for, for quite a while. And um, I've always enjoyed drawing cartoons. From when I was a child, uh, I started drawing and I never stopped. And I feel fortunate that I was able to wind up in a profession where I could continue to act like a child. Um, I'm going to show you today uh, a bunch of my political cartoons that I've done for the Star Tribune and other papers. I'll show you a few comic strips and some other art that I do, uh, sculptures and paintings and things like that that are not political, that I just do for enjoyment. But it's all cartoony and it's my life as a cartoonist. Um, afterwards, I'll show you some animations that kind of show my drawing process these days and maybe draw a few pictures for you live. Um, I, I, I'll warn you, I don't do that usually, and I, I have difficulty drawing when people are watching, so I have to ask you all to close your eyes while I'm doing it. <laughs> so, um, could we lower the lights a little bit here? And, and would people on the side want to move somewhere where they can see better? Or not? <laughs> Perfect. Now this is just like my office. It's always dark and I have my computer and no one bothers me. So this kind of simulates the life of a cartoonist. Uh, I've been doing political cartoons since 1976. For none of you were born then. Uh, I started at the University of Minnesota Daily. It was called the Daily, a student newspaper. And that was a wonderful place to learn, to make mistakes, to figure out how to draw cartoons. Uh, that's what I always tell student cartoonists. A good place to start is on a student paper or a magazine and find your little niche and practice and just go for it. My first real job was with the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette, a small paper in Indiana. I was there for three years, and that was, again, a wonderful opportunity for me because they gave me the freedom and encouragement to draw what I felt and, and express myself without censorship or intimidation. Um, I'm going to be talking on Friday to uh, a, a class about the subject of intimidation and, and uh, harassment of cartoonists around the world. This will be a more cheerful presentation than Friday's. Um, but if you want to hear about, about uh, the difficulties that many cartoonists around the world face, then that's where you'll want to hear about it. Uh, now I work for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I've been there since 1981. And uh, that also has been a wonderful place for me to work. They, they basically print whatever I give them. Um, I, I, I don't take that for granted. Uh, it's, their presses, not mine, and every day I turn my work in and I realize that they might say no. They have not done that yet. Well, but twice in my career they've said no, and they're both for very ridiculous reasons. Um, but that's a pretty good record for being a cartoonist. Uh, I've done a total of, right now it's close to 9,000 cartoons. Some of them are good, uh, a good portion of them are not. But when you have to do a cartoon to be published in the paper every day, it's like putting your homework in the paper. And I have that little space that I have to fill. That's, that's my job. So I, I do my best every day, and I, I can, I'm, I'm proud of my cartoons. Uh, the ones that aren't, that, that aren't so successful, I just felt I did my best that day. Uh, let's start looking at cartoons then. Oh, uh, cartooning in the USA. Right now there are about 60 full-time staff editorial cartoonists in America. When I started in this business, there were over 300. And due to the reduction in the number of newspapers, due to uh, cartoonists losing their jobs, due to being fired or retirement or death, um, oftentimes a publisher will decide to save that money rather than 
hire a cartoonist and pay a salary. They can just pay a small amount and use a syndicated cartoon from another newspaper for a much lower rate. So for economic reasons more than anything else, uh, cartooning, editorial cartooning in America is something of a dying breed. My daily process, I, I get to work and I begin by reading newspapers and blogs and looking at the internet, seeing what's new. There are several papers I try to read cover to cover, our own paper for sure. I, I look at the New York Times and uh, I glance at the headlines in some of the other papers. Uh, I work on sketches, come up with ideas. Every day I try to come up, come up with at least three or four ideas. That way, the next day, if I can't think of something, I can go back to the previous day's rejects and uh, use one of those. I, once I have my sketches, I go to my colleagues, the, the editorial writers or the news assistants, and show them my sketches and ask what they think. And sometimes they don't understand them, so I reject those. Or sometimes they think they're hilarious and funny and I should use them. Sometimes one person will understand it and another person won't. So it's quite a balance. In the end, I make my own decision of which one I want to use. But I do listen to other people's opinions before I decide which cartoon to go with. Then I draw my cartoon and show it to my editor. This is important. I draw my cartoon, I decide on the cartoon, and then I finish it and show my editor. And then he has the option of saying yes or no. And so far he said yes. Uh, the cartoons I'm going to show you, I, I'm starting with my early work um, from maybe uh, 30 years ago, 34 years ago. Um, I wanted to show you my earlier drawing style so you can understand how my work has developed over the years and also um, get a sense of the work of a beginner versus someone who's been at it for a while. Oh, here's my brainstorming sketches. Um, as you can see, they make absolutely no sense, and, and I, don't, I, I don't try to make sense. I, I'll take a piece of paper, and I might think of maybe three or four different topics that are in the news, and I'll just start scribbling. And sometimes I'll scribble one of the characters in the news, and other times I'll draw little monsters or, or elves or animals or this or that, and it makes no sense to you, but to me, this is very clear. It makes sense to me. <laughs> That's how a cartoonist thinks. That's my raw brain right there. Uh, my style has changed over the years. I, when I first started, I used pen and ink, as most cartoonists do. I experimented later using charcoal and pencil for, to get different effects. You'll see a couple examples of that. Um, I started by my career before computers were even invented. And, and as they were brought into the newsroom, I, latched onto those and started working with uh, digital art. And a couple years ago, I got an iPad and started to draw on my iPad. And now I do my entire cartoons on the iPad. I'll have a little demonstration at the end of this to show you what it looks like when I'm drawing on an iPad. Here's an early cartoon. This is President Ronald Reagan. And he had a program called Reaganomics. That was his, pro his plan for our economy. And as a cartoonist, I thought his, his, his ideas were terrible and, and I was being critical. But here I was in my early 20s uh, and I was all, allowed to draw a cartoon of our president doing a bad job. And it's really remarkable. I started school as a marketing major I gave that up because I flunked economics three times. <laughs> Yet here I am advising the President of the United States on how to handle the economy. <laughs> it, it, free speech is wonderful. This is President Bill Clinton, who uh, famously got in trouble with Monica Lewinsky and sex shenanigans in the White House. And when that happened, I was a supporter of Bill Clinton. Um, yet, I thought he was hiding, this is the seal of the presidency, he was hiding behind the presidency to defend himself for the scandal of the Monica Lewinsky case. This is the issue of nuclear proliferation, uh, the, the subject of nuclear technology being spread to different countries around the world, 
Um, and I thought it might be a dangerous thing for the world if, if more and more countries had the, the power to use atomic bombs. And I drew the world as being very vulnerable to what could happen. Uh, here's the subject of guns. Now this issue is a big issue in America. Guns, assault weapons, check out the new fall lines. Meaning the new fall fashions, the new autumn fashions every year. But here the fashion is the lines on the street that the police draw around gun victims. I've done many cartoons about guns in America over the years. Uh, that's an issue that's very important to me and our situation has gotten worse and worse as time goes on. My cartoons have not helped. Here's a cartoon about Tiananmen Square. This is, uh, I, I use the quote from Bertolt Brecht, the German uh, playwright and poet. The people have lost the confidence of the government. The government has decided to dissolve the people and to appoint another one. Uh, when this happened, it shook the world and, and cartoonists across the world responded. I, I don't know how Hong Kong cartoonists handled that case, but I wanted to show this as something that I know if I was a Chinese cartoonist in Beijing, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> uh, one important thing that happened, one, one of the many important things that happened at the Tiananmen incident was the famous photograph of the lone man standing in front of a line of tanks. And that became a metaphor throughout the world for cartoonists whenever they were drawing on the subject of uh, courage in the face of overwhelming force. And here's an example of a cartoon I did not draw. Another cartoonist named Marian Kamensky in Slovakia drew this in regards to the protest here, showing one man representing the Occupy movement standing up to the tanks. Now, I've used the image of the tanks and the lone man for a number of different issues, but it, it was one of those incredibly important images that that become a shorthand for a concept that can be used in expressing yourself in many different ways. Uh, when the Tiananmen Square incident happened, a couple days after that, I, I started to wonder about Hong Kong, knowing that the Tiananmen happened in 1989, and knowing that eight years from then, Hong Kong would be turned over to China. And I, I was fearful of what would happen. And here's the cartoon that I drew. This is the character of Hong Kong saying, gulp, grand opening, there's a time lock, saying in 1997. And in the meantime, representing Tiananmen Square, I, I imagine that the people of Hong Kong must have felt very afraid or agitated, knowing that that would happen soon. Moving further in time, this was drawn on the day of 9-11, the day that the Twin Towers in New York were attacked and destroyed. When that happened, uh, no one knew who knocked those buildings down. No one knew who was attacking. They didn't know how many were attacking. They didn't even know, we didn't even know where our president was. We didn't know anything other than the horror of that day. And this cartoon expresses the emotion of of horror and tragedy and incomprehension of what had happened. After 9-11, America reacted by, well first they invaded uh, Afghanistan in order to catch the Al-Qaeda people, but they also, in regards to the Edward Snowden stuff, uh, began to use surveillance against Americans, and they began warning Americans that you must not, you must be careful what you say, you must be careful what you write. And that was a totally new concept for Americans. Yes, everyone was afraid and wanted to be protected, yet at the same time, they were concerned that their privacy would be violated. So I drew this, anti-terror surveillance. Is it possible to feel safer and creeped out at the same time? 
I felt that's how people felt, that they were being watched all the time. For our own good, of course, but still. As I said, our reaction was to invade Afghanistan, but that was followed by George Bush's decision to invade Iraq, a disastrous mistake. Uh, when, when he first began planning it, they assured us, we're just thinking about it, we're just thinking about it, we're not actually going to do it. No decision has been made, yet at the same time, all of the troops were being gathered and all of the supplies were being prepared. Everyone knew a decision had already been made. This is George Bush again with his Iraq policy, saying, we're changing the world. And the way he was changing it, he was increasing anti-Americanism around the world. As you can see, cartoonists can be very critical of their own leaders, but it's not treasonous. It's self-expression, and that's a strength, I believe. Here's George Bush and his administration. They kept assuring us that things were going to get better just around the corner. But then we've run out of corners to turn. These are very harsh cartoons. I was concerned that George Bush's next plan was to attack Iran. For my next number, fortunately that didn't happen, but as you can see, even today there are American politicians who are still clamoring to attack Iran. Here's the difference between Cuba and Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, where George Bush set, set up a prison camp. Mr. Castro, tear down that gulag. It's easy to point fingers without considering our own policies. The war in Iraq kept grinding on. It is a civil war. It's not a civil war. It is a civil war. <laughs> the thing is, the American people didn't really know what was going on. We had our troops over there. We got rid of Saddam Hussein, but we, when this happened, America didn't even know the difference between Shiites and Kurds and, and, and Sunni. We knew nothing about Iraq, except Saddam Hussein is a bad guy. And, and with that kind of ignorance, we plunge ahead, and this is the result. It doesn't matter if it is a civil war or not. Look at the result. It's bodies and graves. Ten years into the Iraq war, I drew this one. Uh, Iraq, ten years anniversary. You shouldn't have, really. Where the birthday candles are changed with terrible events. Here's a recent cartoon. Don't worry, I've got your back. This is uh, the symbol of the Republican Party, one of our parties in the US, uh, stand, trying to protect the coal plants and the coal industry from any regulation or any change of pollution laws. But at the same time, they're protecting the climate change, the global warming, and, and hurting the environment. Plus, I just like to draw dinosaurs. <laughs> I, I do a lot of animals, dinosaurs, and monsters, and, and creatures, just because I, I liked doing that as a child, and I, I'm still a child. <laughs> this is uh, the bank, J.P. Morgan. When uh, the world economy kind of fell apart, one of the big problems was the banks, and the J.P. Morgan Bank was found to uh, engage in very speculative gambling type of uh, uh, policies that with with people's money that, that turned out to be very unethical. Here's our own Occupy movement, Occupy against the, the elites in, in America. It was an economic protest, uh, unlike yours. Uh, the Wall Street demonstrators were jailed for protesting, but the Wall Street bankers were, were not jailed for destroying the entire world economy. And the juxtaposition of who it is that we're really against and who it is that we really want to protect, um, that, that was a situation that outraged me to this day, that the people who ruined people's homes, their, their, their life savings were lost. And in the end, none of them were punished. In fact, most of them made more money. 
This is Lance Armstrong, though, famous bicyclist, who was found to have actually uh, had his skills enhanced by drugs. This was an odd story. This is just a humorous thing. Uh, there was a big story in the U.S. about a Carnival cruise line. Uh, it was a, a cruise from hell. They, the generators broke down, the toilets overflowed, they ran out of food. Um, eventually the engines broke down and they had to be towed. And America was transfixed at the plight of these poor people who just wanted to go on a cruise and wound up with a horrible experience. And I imagine a little man uh, stuck on a desert island and finally a ship comes by and even that he doesn't want to be found. Um, this was supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, sometimes they do cartoons about just strange little things that don't really, they're not important, it's not political, it's not a world changing issue. But if I do a cartoon on something like that, maybe a person who just wants to be amused will see my cartoon and then come the next day to see what else I drew. Back to Iraq. Um, this is uh, Prime Minister Maliki when he wanted the U.S. troops to come back after Barack Obama had them leave as, as they, it was agreed upon. And this is the shape of Iraq. And my cartoon suggests that yes, they want us to come back, but do we really want to go back? The Arab Spring, uh, the, the tyrant Mubarak was deposed by the popular will of the people and replaced with someone new. Yet, right away, the free press was again attacked. And I imagine the Sphinx as a big cat playing with a cat toy, the free press, poor reporter. This is the Malaysia flight that disappeared. And, and when that happened, it, it was such a mystery, it, it transfixed the world. And I was looking for a way of, of expressing the fear that people feel, feel, the anxiety. People who use the airplane every day to, to get around, we, we can't live without it. Yet, every time you step onto a plane, you're putting your life at risk. The figure of death. Sometimes it seems like the world is so overwhel overwhelmingly tragic that I, I had trouble even focusing on one topic. It, it, the figure of death seems to be everywhere sometimes. This is a depressing cartoon for people to wake up to in the morning. Uh, I, I use the figure of death probably too much. Here he is again. This is Ebola and how today there's a number of victims and next week they pr project another amount and next month even more and the way things are going, if we don't get this solved, it's just a growing problem. And I was looking for a way to visually e express that horror. Scotland independence. Independence fever. This is a takeoff on the famous Marilyn Monroe photo. <laughs> this was a fun cartoon to draw. I, I was hoping our previous guest would have worn his kilt. And I did another cartoon on this topic. Uh, the Scottish guy, independence, yet the British fellow doing everything they could to keep that from happening. I didn't really feel one way or the other about the Scottish independence question, whether they became independent or not. I, I think that um, it was up, for them to, uh, up to them to decide, and, and uh, I, I wasn't really advocating one way or another. I was basically just illustrating the news in a humorous way. <laughs> this is a North Korea voting machine. And you have two choices. You can pick Lil' Kim or someone else. And then he says, well, what do you know? 100% for re-election again. He's, he's been a, a fun character to draw. Oh, he's a frightening guy. Um, here he is. Oh, this is another one on him. Um, over North Korean airspace. Deploy Ritalin. That's a drug used for hyperactive children. <laughs> so rather than bomb him, I think we should calm him down. 
This cartoon is about America and our infrastructure, and things are crumbling. I come here and I'm so impressed with your subways and your transportation, and it, 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 it's a contrast to my own country where I believe that we're not investing in our bridges and our, and our trains and, and things like that, and we cannot hope to be successful in the future if we don't invest in that. I, I believe the austerity um, efforts have gone too far. And this is how I was trying to express that. Greece, uh, they were having economic problems, and they also decided to go with an austerity program. And as you can see, I did not believe that that was the most efficient way to make progress. Here's another Greece cartoon. They kept giving them more and more bailouts, but as I suggest, uh, the problem is not just giving them more bailouts, it was more substantial than that. Greece again. I, 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 I show you these to show that there are many ways to express an idea, and oftentimes we pick um, imagery that everyone can understand, that everyone can relate to, and, and use those as a tool to make a comment. And, and this is just Greece burdened by, by, by debt and, and crippling IOUs. Here's gun control again. The group that is trying to stop any sensible gun control in the U.S. is called the NRA, National Rifle Association. And they're so focused on their own agenda, they're willing to completely ignore the horrible toll, the horrible cost that has befallen America because of it. Gun control again. Over 600 shooting deaths just since Newtown. But who's counting? And that's the inf infinity of the U.S. gun culture, the figure of death. Now this cartoon is no longer accurate. The proper number right now is over 13,000. Global warming. I imagine the North Pole and the South Pole coming together under a flood. Signs of the times. As the, as the ice caps melt, where will it all end? Here's a fellow at the beach. He didn't want to listen to the seashell, put it to his ear. It's not so fun listening to the ocean these days. Overfishing, global warming, water pollution, reef destruction. Here's America completely dependent on Mideast oil. And that's something that's plagued our economy for a long time, and as a result, our foreign policy. A lot of the wars in the Mideast are about oil to an extent, and our dependence kind of makes us uh, crazy. Uh, employees and stockholders seem to be getting less than the CEOs of uh, corporations. That was one of the Wall Street protesters' points, was that in America, it seems that the people at the very top, the CEOs of corporations, the, the elite, will do whatever it takes to make sure that their share of the pie is the largest and everyone else comes second. Here's poll, the, the, the previous poll, and the sex abuse scandal that was plaguing the church the Catholic Church, and uh, I was depicting it as a terrible threat. Uh, we have a new pope who's much more popular. Um, hopefully he'll do more in regard to the abuse scandal, but he's already made an impression. I, I'm, I'm liking the new tone. Um, when he became the pope, he had a, a whole different tone uh, more inclusive, more welcoming, for instance, to gay couples. He, he uh, said that he was not judgmental. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that now, but um, I, I like the new pope better than the old pope. Here's the old pope again. You see this cartoon? I'm very upset with you for not speaking out against homosexuality. And the same goes to your friend. Now, I, I included this cartoon basically because this cartoon 
uh, received more complaints than any cartoon I have ever done, <laughs> including from my parents, who are Catholics. And when it came time to assemble my collection of cartoons to submit for the Pulitzer Prize, I put this one in specifically because I got the most complaints about it. <laughs> Barack Obama, when he first appeared on the scene, he was like a rock star. Uh, when he was campaigning, he had uh, he was campaigning in, in, in sports stadiums, and he would fill stadiums like a rock star, and they'd bring in rock musicians to play at his rallies, and it was very exciting to everybody except Hillary Clinton down here, who wasn't exactly happy at all. Uh, here's a fist bump with uh, Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge historical event for Barack Obama to become our president, our first black president. It was very exciting. Um, at the time, I was more optimistic about Mr. Obama and, and the change that he was going to bring. I, I, I still am happy with a lot of things he's done. I, I'm still, I, I count myself a supporter of, of Barack Obama for the most part, the health care and a number of other things. Um, but he's not perfect. He's not still not uh, the best president I could imagine. When he first took office, George Bush threw the keys to the car, the economy. Um, if you recall, the, the world economy was collapsing. It, it's like you know, the exact worst time to become president, they give the job to the black guy. Um, And he did what he could. He, he had to bail out the banks, the auto companies, the housing. Good morning, sunshine. And the US Treasury just didn't have the money. Now this cartoon, uh, I, I don't have a lot of fans who are conservatives in, in America, Republicans. And they generally don't care for my work. But this cartoon they love. And, and this cartoon they put on their blogs and on their Facebook pages, they just love this one um, because it's critical of Barack Obama. The economy didn't improve. Here's the scenic economy overlook. And as you can see, things were not going well. The housing market was not doing well. Many people lost their homes during that economic problem. I like to draw animals. You see, I like to draw animals. Any excuse to draw animals. Barack Obama was a jet, was reelected for a second term, and he had plans on things he wanted to do, and the Republican Party had plans on things they wanted to do, which is basically destroy anything Barack Obama wanted to do. <laughs> and that's how I depicted that. Here's the Mideast traffic cop, Barack Obama. As you can see, uh, the traffic cop is going to be very successful. He's had a few problems here and there. Again, the Arab Spring, um, Egypt, a tragic situation. Um, trying to create a democracy, you know, the military fighting every step of the way. That's, uh, again, a situation that we thought was so hopeful for a while, and now, not so much. Uh, Mr. Assad, um, he's saying, and they said I'd never fill my father's shoes. Uh, Assad's father was the leader of Syria, and he was known for being quite an abusive tyrant. And when his son took over, there was hope that he'd be better. And of course, now we see. I do a lot of blood in my cartoons too, don't I? <laughs> this is global swarming. The threat of ISIS seems to be creeping all over the world, or creeping. Well, yes, it's reaching all over the world. It's reaching Canada and New York, and um, I live in Minnesota which is the home to one of the largest Somali immigrant populations of the US, and a number of our citizens have been recruited to go to the Middle East and fight in these wars for ISIS. 
Uh, I don't think that Islam is the problem. Um, they say, a call to prayer. You're not helping our image problem. And ISIS has a call to barbarism. I don't think Islam is the problem. I, I, I think that, that when it's radicalized and, and, and used in such a way to uh, cause violence and destruction, that's not reflective of Islam. That's reflective of a harsh political agenda. Here's America trying to run the world. Uh, trying to, North Korea has their atomic bomb. Iran is trying to build an atomic bomb. And America thinks that it's up to us to control everybody. And that doesn't always work. Mr. Obama again, uh, he won a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize when he came to office. But now he's known for drones and, and uh, stepping up military operations here and there. And uh, yes, he did get us out of Iraq, sort of. And we're going to be out of Afghanistan, sort of. But we sure are in a lot of other places. So Mr. Snowden. Um, This was focusing on him as a personality. When this first happened, he was in Hong Kong, and then he was in, in Russia, and the US seemed to be a step behind every step of the way. Um, and I just have the US as a hapless giant frog, and it's just, you know, just slips through his fingers, or his tongue, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, here's the NSA. America's sense of privacy is about to be blown away. That's a leaf blower, if you don't know what that is. Again, the NSA, uh, the Statue of Liberty, saying, what have I become? It's almost as if, with, with the revelations of the NSA's operations, that we don't really know what we're about anymore. We're the land of the free and home of the brave, yet in many ways, our country acts in a less than brave way and very less than free. Again, the NSA, with the big vacuum cleaner. Um, I do this when it was revealed that, that um, not only were the emails and information from the bad guys, the terrorists, and, and Europe and around the world being sucked up and, and collected by the NSA, but America's emails and, and information were, was being not just monitored, but saved in, in huge computers. Tell the Americans we don't like them monitoring everything we say. You just did. <laughs> the walls have ears, they say. That's a, an old expression, so I drew the walls with ears. Here's one on China, cyber hack attacks. And when it was revealed that the Chinese military was um, hacking into the computers of not just our government, but businesses and industries, which is not to say that we're not doing the same thing, but this is reflective of the story of the day. Uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, that one I stuck myself. The Russian ballots uh, election that uh, he won so handily, amazingly, by such huge amounts that I was suspicious that there wasn't some tampering going on in that vote. Here's Russia and the Ukraine. It struck me that Vladimir Putin was instigating and encouraging a lot of the problems that were going on in Ukraine as a bad neighbor. <laughs> and I had a lot of guts picking this cartoon because my yard is a mess. <laughs> Again, Mr. Putin, the Russian gas supply, and he's using that as a way of intimidating the people of Europe um, in, in terms of how they respond to the Ukrainian situation. And I, OK, that's all the, the political cartoons I have. Um, in addition to my work for the newspaper, I also do a children's comic feature. It's just puzzles and riddles and games for children. It appears one day a week in the comics, in the funny section. 
and I'll just show you some examples. It's just little word games and for little kids, and it's fun to do. I don't have to think about politics. I never do blood and guts. I get to draw my animals and monsters, and uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun, and I get good reaction. It's interesting. I, I get reaction from uh, children. They write letters and, and say how much they enjoy it, and I get a lot of mail from the elderly who have a lot of free time, I guess, and, and enjoy doing this. And I also get letters from prisoners in jail who I suppose have nothing better to do than word searches and puzzles and riddles. Here's another one of those, a little beaver, and it's just a little poem goes on there and a funny little drawing and a, and a puzzle. Uh, in addition to that, those things I, are, are, are my money makers, that's how I make my living. I also do personal art, um, and this is just for fun. Sometimes I sell them, but mostly it's for my own enjoyment. I like to experiment with different media. I, I started playing with digital illustration. I do oil paintings. I had a painting studio for a while, and I make sculptures out of mixed media. Uh, here's a digital image. Uh, this was with a 3D drawing program that I downloaded on my computer and just started to play with. It's a lot of fun. This is an oil painting. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun to do. It, it, it took me like three months to do because it, it was my first one. And uh, I, I taught myself how to do it. I got a lot of books out of the library and read techniques and, and how the old masters made their paintings. I wanted to do a combination of uh, old, old master, Renaissance style, classical painting mixed with googly-eyed cartoons. And that's what came out of it. Here's another one. Um, I did this for my wife. I have, she has three cats. She has three cats, and that's what they look like, the three right there. <laughs> she liked that one quite a bit. I have to clean up after those cats, so I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that big of a fan. This one is called The Babysitter. And you can see it right up in the corner there, up in the antler, there's the one little ducky watching. We, get, we have a lot of moose in Minnesota, so that's kind of what inspired that. And this is just some old rockers, drawn just for the fun of it. Uh, this is how they used to watch 3D movies in the 1950s. And I came across an old black and white photograph of people watching a movie in 3D, and I just kind of made it into a cartoony version and, and made a painting out of it. This is one of my sculptures. Uh, I, I make sculptures out of paper mache, which is just glue and paper mixed together. It's usually uh, a media that children do. They, they make masks and things like that, but I decided to make fine art out of it. Here's another one. This is about um, as big as this desk here, the, the big piece. But out of paper mache, it's light enough that I can lift it, so it was fun to do. This is one that hangs from the ceiling. And this is a combination of punk and mermaid together. And here's the jester. As you see, even when I do my fine art, it's still fun art. It's still funny and goofy and silly. I have trouble being serious about anything. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I wish I could do beautiful landscapes. If I made a beautiful landscape, I'd probably put a, I don't know, a dinosaur in there somewhere. <laughs> yes, a dinosaur. Um, it, it's, I can't stop. I, I figure other people can do realistic things better than I ever could, but maybe they can't do cartoons as well as I can do. Here's another one. This is called Born to be Wild. And my mother did not like this sculpture, and that's because 
can't see it, but in the back, her bong shows. Uh, there's a big fish. Here's something I've been doing lately. This is wire art. I just take a big piece of wire and, and bend it and shape it. Use a little bit of solder welding here and there. That's, the blue part is paper, but it's basically a, just a line drawing in wire into the shape that uh, you can recognize. There's another piece, kind of abstract. And uh, it's, it's fun just thinking of new ways of creating art. Still cartoony, but uh, it just kind of stretches my creative muscles. And I don't know what this is. It's, uh, I got a piece of wood that was round, and I got some wire, and I don't know if it's a clock or what, but I started making little bits on it and kept at it till I was tired of it. And that's my personal stuff. Uh, as I said, I, I draw my cartoons now on the iPad. And uh, I, I, I got an iPad a couple of years ago and I found a drawing program. It cost $3, um, which is pretty cheap. And uh, not only could I draw my pictures on my iPad from wherever I happen to be, but it, it, has a, it has a feature where it records your drawing. The entire drawing from beginning to end um, is recorded. And I'll show you what that looks like. As you can see, uh, I make mistakes as I go along. You might see the image change size, or maybe another part moved from one place to another. Um, doing art digitally allows for lots of mistakes, which I embrace, because I don't feel like I have to be perfect from the very beginning. The actual drawing took a little longer than this. <laughs> This might be two or three hours long. I can work in different layers. Uh, I, can, I can change colors. I can move things around, make corrections. It's kind of magical. My least favorite fun is doing the lettering. I, I can't stand doing the lettering, but gotta do it. See, I change shape here and there. That's that's what that is. The flexibility of drawing digitally has a lot of wonderful advantages. Hold on, I got a couple more of those. How do I go to the next one? These are cartoons that you saw earlier. I've just shown you how they came together. So here I had to draw each individual little bit of that cartoon. Uh, you can't see it on this animation, but I was able to zoom in. So the entire square there would have been just one of those tiny little drawings. And I could reduce it down to the size to put it on the cake. So I'm not drawing tiny, I'm drawing big. But it looks tiny in here. I put lots of detail in these things, probably more than people can actually see when they see the cartoon. The, there's been a study about cartoons that says the average person looks at a cartoon for six seconds. So I, I spend all day long on these things, and you people give me six seconds. <laughs> But it's, it's fun to watch the drawings come together. I, when, I, when I'm at a fair or a festival and I see a caricaturist, I always stop to watch because I love to watch people draw. It seems like magic to me. I don't know how they do it. 
Here I removed the back of the drawing so I could concentrate on just the lettering. That's a nice thing about digital, so. And of course it's on a different layer that I can just bring right back. Pop it back in there. Throw in a background. Put in some characters. Do some details. Those characters look a little bit big. I think I'd probably reduce that a little bit in size. You don't think about all these little details when you look at a cartoon. There's the Uncle Sam character coming in. And it's nice because if I didn't like how it turned out, I could just push a button and go back and redo an entire section. And in the old days, when you're drawing one drawing on a piece of paper, you make a mistake, well, you've got a problem. And go with the lettering, and you're done. I have one more of these. <laughs> Hong Kong protests. Now I use the symbol of the dragon to represent the uh, Beijing government. Cartoonists tend to take whatever symbols that I would be universally recognized as a shorthand. Sometimes we simplify too much. Sometimes people don't understand their symbols. This cartoon I drew last week. And it was wonderful because it's an animal, it's a kind of a dinosaur. <laughs> and it's a current event. And I knew I was coming to Hong Kong. For me, the idea part of a cartoon, I spend several hours trying to come up with an idea, and then when I start drawing, I relax and I'm happy because the drawing part for me is the, is the joy. See, I, I, I had the eye open before, but then I decided to change it like he was straining. Um, little decisions like that as I go along, I kind of, I don't have to have a whole image in my mind before I start drawing. I can, just kind of let it come as it, as it develops on its own. I had trouble with the character holding the umbrella. You might see that I'll be drawing it several times before I had a version that I liked. Changing the size, adjusting little tiny adjustments that are microscopic to you, but to me it's life or death. And then that's how it turned out in the end. Almost in the end. And that's my life as a cartoonist. I guess I'm going to be drawing a couple pictures for you here. Now normally I don't do this. I, 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 I can't draw when people are watching me. I, I get nervous. And I can't use my undo digital tricks to correct my mistakes because it's, this is it. But I'll try. Um, I'm going to start, start by drawing uh, Barack Obama. Oh, yeah. I usually start drawing, um, when I draw a character, I usually start with the eyes. Well, that doesn't look quite like Barack Obama yet. <laughs> or does it? Does it? I could be done. Uh, I usually go from there to the character's head. For Barack Obama, he has a nice round head. <laughs> Very simple. When he first became president, his hair was black. Now his hair is quite gray. So that's basically his head. I think I made his head too small. 
but imagine this is a little bit bigger. He doesn't have that tiny a brain. Then I move down to his nose. That's what I usually do. And then I try to think of what I want the mouth to be doing. Um, I'm going to just draw his mouth closed because it's faster without doing all those teeth. He has kind of a distinctive look to the side there. See, I, I hate this cartoon already. I, I'm, I'm not pleased. Yeah, that's basically him. Um, of course, cartoonists have all latched onto the one feature. Um, his ears, yeah. And sometimes you make them too big. Sometimes not big enough. It's um, kind of a matter of taste. But I'll, I'll do ears. He's kind of a skinny guy. I usually make tiny bodies. I make my characters as really tiny little, little characters. Um, I believe in, in, in making characters, usually I make them cute. I like the image itself to be cute. I believe in the power of cuteness. People like to look at cute things. And then I can have them doing horrible things. And, and the, the juxtaposition of, of someone who's very cute um, doing something horrible, it, it, to me, it makes an image compelling. Now this is just a caricature. This is just a drawing of, of the president. It's not a political cartoon yet. Um, I could easily make it into one, and no, that's not what you think. Um, this is Okay. I'm kind of fudging on the hands here because those can be difficult. Now it's a political cartoon. As I said, um, cartoonists usually try to simplify images and use symbols whenever possible. And each, as many countries have a, have, a, have a symbol that identifies them as that country. I, I use the dragon for China. Um, you know, America has has the eagle, our national symbol, strong and brave. Russia as a symbol of the bear. See the countries don't exactly see eye to eye. And uh, I guess that's it. Uh, any questions?
questions? Can you draw an impression of what you thought of us when you first came to us? <laughs> I, I, I can't draw it. I, my impression is so positive. It really is. Um, I, I found the people warm and engaging I, and frankly very impressive. You know, whatever you think of what's going on in the protests, whatever side you're on, you have to admire uh, the courage and and the message. And maybe maybe some disagree with the tactics and fear for the results. It's something that uh, has transfixed the world. Uh, superficially, you know, driving it, flying in, looking out the window. Um, Hong Kong is a wonder. I, I came in at night and and uh, seeing the city glowing was it's so beautiful. Uh, I, I've been to Hong Kong before during the day, flying over it, and uh, the skyline is so impressive. The, your infrastructure, uh, the school. I, I have very positive thoughts about Hong Kong, and I usually draw things kind of nasty, so I'd be hesitant to try to depict it that way. Okay, next question. Hi, Ms. Zach. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, what kind of qualities does it take to be a good cartoonist? And the second one is, which one do you prefer? Political cartoon or more of a fine art type? Thank you. Uh, what kind of qualities a cartoonist should have? The easy answer would be, to be a political cartoonist, um, you have to be a smart ass who can draw. <laughs> and, and you know the, the real answer would probably be more complicated than that, but that's what it boils down to. Um, when I was growing up, I loved to draw, and it, 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 I liked drawing cartoony type things. I thought I might be an animator or uh, work in advertising. But I also had an interest in politics from a young age, and I would read the news, and I'd be fascinated by the world, and. Uh, it, it, it just seemed like, I, I actually never considered that I could bring those two interests together. And it wasn't until I was in college, I saw an opening on the student newspaper for a cartoonist. And to be honest, I didn't know that people did it for a living. I, I didn't know that. And I started drawing cartoons at the newspaper. Uh, I was there for a couple of years, improving my skills, until I was offered a job with the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. Now, they didn't ask me what my degree was in. I didn't have a degree. I had to graduate. Um, they didn't ask to see my, my art scores. They didn't ask where I learned how to, how to draw. All they cared about, for, for what I do, was what was going to appear in the newspaper under their name. You know, was it something they would be proud of? And it was a true merit-based merit decision. They, they liked my stuff. So, um, I would say to be a good political cartoonist, you should be able to draw or have a good drawing style. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be detailed. Some cartoonists are very elaborate and detailed, and, and the art is beautifully designed. Others have a very simple style, very simple, almost like stick men. But their ideas are so powerful, and it, it matches so well to their message that they're successful. So. It's, it's drawing that matches your ideas, having imagination, and having an interest in the world, and not being afraid to express your true opinion. Uh, last question. Last question. Uh, hello, Steve. I want to know, uh, how can you maintain this positive attitude for that long? And uh, uh, what will you do if you uh, cannot get inspired or feel depressed? What, what do I, if I don't get inspired for? Uh, you don't get inspired or oh, okay. First of all, did I answer both of your questions? The second one? The second one? I missed the second one? <laughs> I'm sorry, let's go back. What was your second one? <laughs> Uh, I, I enjoy them both. They're both different. They're both different ways of using my mind. As you see, I love to do paintings and sculptures and not think about 
those events. But I do think about those events, and, and in that context, there's no better way to express myself with my skills and the way I see the world than doing cartoons. It's two different things. It's like saying, you know, what do you like? Do you like pizza or do you like uh, ramen, whatever? You know, it, it, it's a different thing. Different, different flavors for different times. Now, remind me your question again, your two questions. <laughs> Okay. Uh, as far as inspiration, I, 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 I try to come up with three or four ideas every day. I'll, I'll sit for several hours, I'll try to come up with an idea, that might work, and I'll work on another idea, that might work. I'll look at a different topic entirely, come up with an idea for that. Out of all of those ideas, the different topics, I pick the best idea. Maybe it's not the most important story in the, in the world that day, but I'll pick the one that most interesting or, or is most successful as a cartoon. The next day, if I am, as you say, depressed or, or, or I can't think of something, I'll go back to the previous day's pile of rejected ideas and, and just use one of those that I didn't use the day before. Um, as far as being positive um, about the world, I'm not all that positive about the world. You know, you saw the, the figure of death and all of the horrible things going on, and Yes, it, it, it gets depressing because my job is to look at the world and describe my feelings towards it. And sometimes I get sick of reading the newspaper. I really do. Here I am having a great time in Hong Kong, and part of it is I don't have to read the newspaper until I get back home. And it's not that... I mean, it, it gets overwhelming. It really does. The world can be a very horrible place. And at the same time, you know, we have to live it. And what can you do sometimes but laugh? And you know, looking for humor in things that are not humorous, you can at least look for a way of seeing it and expressing it that um, addresses that. I just wanted to ask you quickly about the the switch to digital, doing it on the iPad. Do you feel it's changed your style? Is it? Are you are you happier with your captains now than before? And also, within the to this uh, society, it is, is there a split between traditionalists who think that you, you should still do that on paper, or? Uh, not, not a split so much. There are a wide variety of styles. There, there are so many cartoonists, and each one uses whatever media they're most comfortable with. Um, for myself, now I'm doing digital. Two years ago, I was drawing on paper, scanning it, and then enhancing it with the computer. Before that, I would use charcoal. And you saw the charcoal drawings. Um, I like the way that that worked out. That was an experiment. Before that, I used pen and ink. And you know, if I was 100% satisfied with any of those, I would have stuck with them. But I have a restlessness about my art that I'm always thinking of new ways. I'm trying to find. It's a, a never-ending search for the perfect pen or the perfect brush, or the perfect media. And, you know, I've been doing the iPad stuff for two years, and I would bet in a year or two I'll be doing something completely different, maybe cartoons out of toothpicks, or, you know, who knows what, mosaics, or, or who knows. You know, it's, as an artist, you push yourself. And I can look at any cartoonist that I truly admire and look at the course of their career, at the beginning, they'll have one style, and then it'll change to something else, and something else, and at the end of their career, it'll look either totally different or somewhat different. And that's because they were restless. They looked at their work and thought, I can do better by changing my cross-hatching, or using a different kind of a pen, or different kind of a paper. And as an artist, that's the artist part, not the journalist part. The artist part is looking for the best way to paint the idea land on your paper. That's so our appreciation for Mr. Sack. Uh, thanks for coming and hope you guys enjoyed today's uh, talks and uh, take part in other uh, talks as well. Thank you. Thanks for coming.
Can I, can I just say one thing? If anybody had any extra questions, I'll be hanging around here and I'll, I'll stay as long as you want. Know.